This is Space Time, Series 23, Episode 131. Coming up on Space Time. Planet Earth closer to a supermassive black hole than previously thought. The ancient mega floods which changed the landscape of Mars. And the iconic Arecibo radio telescope comes crashing down and is now gone forever. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. A new study claims planet Earth is some 2,000 light years closer to the supermassive black hole at the centre of the Milky Way galaxy than previously thought. The new measurements place the galactic centre and its resident supermassive black hole Sagittarius A star some 25,800 light years away. That's much closer than the official value of 27,700 light years adopted by the International Astronomical Union in 1985. The findings come from a new model of the Milky Way galaxy based on observational data including a catalogue of objects observed over more than 15 years by a string of radio telescopes spread across Japan. VERA, the Very Long Baseline Interferometry Exploration of Radio Astrometry project, was started in the year 2000 to map three-dimensional velocity and spatial structures in the Milky Way. Astrometry involves measuring the positions and motions of celestial objects. It's a vital tool in understanding the overall structure of the galaxy and Earth's place in it. Because the Earth's located inside the Milky Way galaxy, it's difficult to see exactly what our galaxy looks like from the outside. It's a bit like not being able to see the forest because of all the trees. Vera uses a technique known as interferometry to electronically combine data from radio telescopes scattered across the Japanese archipelago. This allows them to work as a single giant telescope, achieving the same resolution as what you'd get from a single 2,300 kilometer diameter telescope. That resolution allowed astronomers to achieve a measured accuracy of 10 micro arc seconds sharp enough in theory to resolve a penny placed on the surface of the moon. Scientists with the Astronomical Society of Japan have now published the first Vera astrometry catalogue, which includes detailed measurements and data for 99 objects. Based on Vera data, together with recent observations by other astronomers, the authors have been able to develop a new galactic position and velocity map. The new map allowed them to recalculate the centre of the galaxy, the point that everything revolves around. The new findings suggest that the centre of the Milky Way is some 25,800 light years away. That's 1,900 light years closer than any previous calculations. The new data has also allowed the authors to recalculate how fast the Earth and solar system are orbiting around the galactic centre, finding they're travelling at some 227 kilometres per second, 7 kilometres per second faster than previously thought. The authors are now preparing to use Vera to increase their catalogue, observing more objects, especially those close to Sagittarius A star. And this will allow them to better characterise the structure and motion of the galaxy. As part of these efforts, VERA will participate in EVAN, the East Asian Very Long Baseline Interferometry Network, which includes radio telescopes not just in Japan, but also South Korea and China as well. By increasing the number of telescopes and the maximum separation between them, Evan will achieve even higher accuracy rates. This is Space Time. Still to come, the ancient mega floods on the red planet Mars and the Arecibo radio telescope collapses in a pile of rubble. All that and more still to come on Space Time. A new study has suggested ancient gigantic megafloods may once have covered the surface of the red planet Mars, even changing its climate. The findings, published in the journal Scientific Reports, are based on ongoing research by NASA's Mars Curiosity rover. Curiosity's been exploring the floor of Gale Crater since 2012 and slowly making its way up the side of its central peak, Mount Sharp. 
Scientists at Cornell University and the California Institute of Technology suspect that the ancient megafloods began when an asteroid slammed into the Martian surface sometime around 4 billion years ago. The heat generated by that impact melted massive reserves of water ice, turning it into vapour, which condensed to create planet-blanketing storm clouds. The authors speculate that torrential rains from these storms produced mega-flash floods, which then carved and shaped vast areas of the planet's surface, producing 10-metre-tall gravel ripples spaced 140 metres apart in an area known as the Hummocky Plains Unit and ripples and trough band formations in a region known as the Striated Unit. These ancient features couldn't be identified from orbital images, but they were easily observed by the car-sized six-wheel rover and similar structures on Earth are telltale signatures of mega-flood activity. This is space-time. Still to come, the Arecibo radio telescope gone after the structure suddenly collapses, and later in the science report, 2020 on track to become one of the world's warmest years on record. All that and more coming up on space-time. The Arecibo Radio Telescope in Puerto Rico is gone. Its 900-ton instrument platform, suspended by cables 140 metres above the centre of the dish, has collapsed, crashing through the parabolic dish below, destroying the structure beyond repair. The cables supporting this instrument platform were connected to three towers spaced around the giant 305-metre dish, which was built into a natural sinkhole formation in the tropical rainforest. The total failure of the supporting cables on December 1st follows two earlier cable breaks in August and November. On August the 10th, an auxiliary cable broke out of its tower socket, smashing down onto the reflector dish, leaving a 30-metre gash. Engineering teams are about to undertake emergency structural stabilisation of the auxiliary cables and were waiting for replacement cables to arrive when on November the 6th, one of the 10 centimetre main support cables suddenly failed, crashing through the dish, causing even more damage. Engineers haven't determined yet why the main support cable broke, but they suspect it's related to the extra load being placed on the cables since the August failure. Interestingly, they've subsequently found that the main cable snapped at just 60% of what should have been its minimum breaking strength. Following the second cable failure in November, engineers concluded that the telescope's structure was in danger of total catastrophic collapse, finding its cables may no longer be capable of carrying the loads they were initially designed to support. They found the damage simply couldn't be stabilised without potentially life-threatening danger to the construction workers. And even if repairs were carried out, the structure would likely present long-term stability issues, leaving the National Science Foundation with little option but to authorise a full controlled demolition. However, even that option was removed from the table at around 8 o'clock in the morning of December the 1st, when a thundering crash echoed through the rainforest as the remaining support cables let go and the instrument platform, all 900 tonnes of it, crashed down through the dish. It's now been revealed that supporting wires were breaking inside the remaining cables at a rate of about one per day, and there was growing speculation on site that the structure only had weeks to live before a total collapse. Senior Arecibo research scientist Dr Jonathan Friedman, who had worked at the observatory for 26 years, says he was at home when he heard what sounded like a rumble and instinctively knew what had happened. Friedman ran up a small hill near the observatory in time to see a cloud of dust hanging in the air where the massive dish once stood. The iconic telescope has played a major role in astronomical discoveries for more than half a century, and it's entered popular culture in feature films like Contact and James Bond Goldeneye. During its 57 years of operation, it survived hurricanes, tropical humidity and a string of earthquakes. So popular was the dish and its unique abilities that some 250 scientists had been using it for their research just before the initial failure put a halt to all their work in August. 
Jonathan Nally, the editor of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, says the loss of Arecibo is a huge blow to the scientific community. It's a terrible loss, a, a, a huge, unique, or almost unique now sort of facility like Arecibo. It's been around since the what, the 60s or so, the 1960s, at least that's when they sort of started getting going. I mean, it's been a groundbreaking sort of telescope. Uh, see, with, with telescopes, one of the things that determines what you can do with a telescope, sort of science you can do, is the size of it, the collecting area, whether that's a, a, a large metal mesh surface like the Arecibo radio telescope or a big mirror for a, um, a normal optical telescope. Having a large surface area gives you sensitivity. It means you can pick up faint signals, whether they are uh, radio signals from um, natural sources out there in the universe, which is what Arecibo did, or whether they're very faint particles of light, which is uh, what a, an optical observatory does. So Arecibo had a huge collecting area, just absolutely enormous. And they built it in a valley because it's a, a very convenient way to do it. It's suspended in this valley, and it couldn't look everywhere in the sky. You could only look in certain directions, but that was good enough for the sort of work that it was doing. So it, it's a terrible loss to lose something like this. I'm just glad that no one was hurt. That's the main thing. There were something like 250 scientists working on projects at the time the first of the cables snapped back in August and they decided to stop all further scientific work with the telescope back then while they worked out what was going on. So that's a lot of work that simply can't be redone very easily. Yeah, well, all of those projects will be now in limbo and you have to feel for those scientists. You'll find that, I suspect what you will find is that other observatories, other organisations around the world will will lend a bit of assistance. They'll say, uh, we'll make some time available for you on our telescopes if they're compatible with the sort of projects you're doing, just to help people out. So that's the way things generally happen when you get a calamity of some kind. They're pretty good, uh, whether it's astronomy or any other scientist. They're pretty good at coming together like that. So I think that some of those projects will be rescued, whether soon or whether it's next year or whenever. But certainly for a lot of the people who are doing work that, that needed Arecibo, uh, it couldn't be done with any other telescope. They're now uh, there. They, they have a problem now. Every telescope has its own unique characteristics, things which make it special for a specific type of science. And Arecibo, with its incredible fidelity, was very much like that, wasn't it? Being so big and being able to look so finely in, at the universe. Yeah, that's right. Look, um, you're quite right. Telescopes are built for... Um, sometimes they're built for specific sort of purposes that have one real strength and they might be weak in other areas, but that's okay because they're, they're designed to answer certain questions and having that particular strength will, will do that. And then you get um, a telescope that might be a general purpose sort of telescope. So, for instance, the Parkes Radio Telescope in New South Wales, Australia, it's more of a, a general purpose telescope. Now, Parkes is a huge telescope, radio telescope. It's very, very large. In fact, it's basically, the, I think there are one, one, maybe two that are bigger than it, but it's right on the limit of the size of a telescope you can build and have the capability of steering it around the sky, pointing it in different directions. Basically, having, having it on a, a tilting mechanism, it means you can point it at different parts of the sky. When they get too big, I mean, there's, there's just too much weight and it would be impractical to make them any bigger. Arecibo was much bigger than Parkes, but there's a, there's a principle in cosmology and, and astrophysics that basically says that on larger scales, the universe looks pretty much the same in any direction, in a broad sense. You know, there are stars throughout our galaxy, then you look past our galaxy and there are lots of other galaxies out in space. And in a general sense, one direction is as good as another when you're trying to answer many astronomical sort of questions. So a huge telescope like Arecibo that could only look in a limited number of directions was perfectly fine because um, that's what it was designed to do in terms of astronomy. And it could answer amazing questions by looking deep into space with, with tremendous sensitivity by having a huge collecting area to pick up faint radio signals. So long and short to answer your question, telescopes are generally built to um, have uh, a prime sort of characteristic that makes them really good in one area and they can also do lots of other good stuff around in different sort of areas of uh, astrophysical science. Of course, Arecibo isn't the first big radio telescope to collapse, is it? No, no. Uh, there was one way back in 1988 called the Green Bank Telescope, which is a more traditional sort of radio telescope and yeah, it just collapsed one day, very unexpectedly. With, with Arecibo, it was sort of on the cards, wasn't it? Because one of the suspension cables snapped not too long ago and, and they were trying to work out what the problem was and whether they were be able to save the whole thing and then of course now the whole thing's come down. But with Green Bank, this enormous big radio telescope just collapsed and I, I think thinking back, there was probably uh, maintenance issues that might not have been um, maintained as well as it could have been. But they built a new one. They built a new one after that. So I don't know what they're going to do with that new, a new Green Bank, that is. I don't know what they're going to do with Arecibo. Um, 
I suspect they won't rebuild Arecibo. There are other telescopes around the world now that can do the same kind of thing. Arecibo itself, if I recall correctly, had been under you know, financial threat several times in the last 20 or 30 years. You know, you know, talk about closing it down to save money to put into other telescopes, which is which is what happens. So this might just obviously progress that idea. I, I rather suspect they won't rebuild it. Will something like the SKA, the Square Kilometre Array, can that replace Arecibo or are they different types of radio telescopes? The Square Kilometre kilometer Array is a different kind of telescope in the, in the sense that Arecibo was one telescope with one collecting area, one surface, with a bunch of receivers picking up uh, the signals. The Square Kilometre Array is a totally different kettle of fish. It's going to have thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of individual antennae, which are all connected up electronically, and it will be able to do pretty much everything Arecibo can do, and much, much more. So the, the square kilometre array, once it gets, um, once it's fully built and up and running, is not an order of magnitude above Arecibo. It'll be two orders of magnitude, or three, um, to what it can do. It can, the square kilometre array will be able to look in every direction of the sky at once basically, and pick up everything in a multitude of different frequencies and, and analyze the data pretty much straight away. It's going to be the most amazing groundbreaking facility that science has seen for a very, very long time. That's Jonathan Alley, the editor of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine. And don't forget, if you're having trouble getting your copy of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine from your usual retailer because of the current lockdown and travel restrictions, you can always get a print or digital subscription and have the magazine delivered directly to your letterbox or inbox. Subscribing is easy. Just go to skyandtelescope.com.au. That's skyandtelescope.com.au and you'll never be left in the dark again. And time now to take a brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. Sydney has just experienced its warmest November on record, and it now looks like 2020 is on track to become one of the world's warmest years on record. A new report by the World Meteorological Society shows that the global mean temperature for January through to October 2020 was around 1.2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. The report also states that 2011 to 2020 will be the warmest decade on record, with the warmest six years on record, all occurring since 2015. A new study has linked high blood pressure in midlife to more extensive brain damage associated with stroke, dementia, physical disabilities, depression and a decline in thinking abilities in the elderly. The findings reported in the European Heart Journal are based on a study of 37,041 participants across the United Kingdom. Researchers found a strong association between diastolic blood pressure, that's the blood pressure between heartbeats, before the age of 50, and brain damage in later life, even if the diastolic blood pressure was within what's considered normally to be a healthy range. However, the authors note that this type of study can show that the high blood pressure recorded actually caused the increases in brain damage that were observed. A new study has confirmed that Tyrannosaurus rex and its close relatives underwent a unique teenage growth spurt not shared by other theropod dinosaurs. The findings reported in the journal of the Proceedings of the Royal Society B are based on a careful examination of growth lines in a range of different types of dinosaurs. Paleontologists found that other carnivorous theropods, such as T. rex's distant cousins, the allosauroids, grew steadily year by year, without experiencing the sudden teen growth spurt common to tyrannosauroids. Tyrannosaurus rex was one of the biggest meat-eating dinosaurs of all time, measuring up to 12.3 metres long from snout to tail, up to 4 metres tall at the hip, and 14 tonnes in weight. Scientists found that the best survival strategy for T. rex was to get really big really quickly, reaching their maximum size by the age of 20, even though they might live for another 13 years. Of course, getting big quickly has a competitive advantage, but it does require a high food intake. That means more work and a higher risk of getting injured. But other theropods found their key to survival was to grow more slowly but continuously throughout their lives, very much like modern-day crocodiles, and this required a lot less energy expenditure, which seemed to work, 
as some allosauroids lived well into their 50s, making them the oldest individual theropods on record, aside from some modern-day birds like parrots. Faster, smaller and smarter, more energy-efficient chips, powering everything from consumer electronics to big data brain-inspired computing, could soon be on its way after engineers at the University of Texas Austin created the smallest memory device yet. The research reported in the journal Nature Nanotechnology follows the discovery two years ago of the physics needed to pack dense memory storage capability into extremely tiny, thin devices. And this new work has reduced that size even further, shrinking the cross-section area down to just a single square nanometer. Scientists found defects or holes in the material provided the key to unlocking high-density memory storage capability. When a single additional metal atom goes into that nanoscale hole, it fills it, conferring some of its conductivity into the material, and this leads to a change or memory effect. Although they use molybdenum disulfide as the primary nanomaterial in their study, the authors think the discovery could also apply to hundreds of related atomically thin materials. The race to make smaller chips and processors allows not only more compact computers and smartphones, but also decreases their energy demands, increasing their capacity, which means faster, smarter devices. This latest version of the Memorista, developed using the advanced facilities of the Oak Ridge National Laboratory, promises storage capacities of around 25 terabits per square centimetre. That's 100 times higher memory density per layer compared with commercially available flash memory devices today. With global air travel suffering a major downturn in business in the wake of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, some airlines are focusing on so-called joy flights to nowhere – during which you spend several hours flying over some interesting tourist attractions before landing back at the same airport you took off from. Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptic says one airline has now taken their marketing a step further, offering what they describe as a magical spiritual experience, flying over some 99 of Thailand's holiest Buddhist religious sites with passengers reciting mantras along the way. The airlines are having a hard time, so they'll try any sort of ways to raise some revenue, and Thai Airways has been running Thai magical flying experience. At the moment, it's just a one-off flight, but basically you take off from the Bangkok airport and you fly over 99 sacred sites in eastern and southern Thailand and then come back to the airport. You don't land, you just fly over the top of them. But by doing that, you will receive positive energy from chanting while on board. Some people have said, this is rather an abuse of Buddhism. Others have said, oh, no, no, it's perfectly in line with Buddhism. It's, it's, uh, it allows us to do it. They'll have a celebrity astrologist, as they call them, on board to lead everyone through the chants, and the food will be served along with a prayer book and an amulet. So there has been suggestions that how serious they are, the airline is, how much of believers they are, or is this just a money-making venture? Who knows? It's not quite the same as flying over Antarctica for sightseeing trips. This is supposed to be giving you a lot of uh, uh, spiritual strength just by flying over these 99 sites. I'm sure for believers it does. I'm sure for believers it does. Yeah, that, that's, that's fun. I mean, there's, there's a lot of things you could do. Yeah. yeah, but yeah, I'm not question. They don't actually say how high they're flying over these things. That would depend on what's in the food and the amulet, wouldn't it? Boom, boom. I presume you still have to comply with civil aviation rules as to how high you can be above these sites. But I mean, three hour flight, you can sort of figure out how far that is. It's just a, a weird thing that. It just goes to show that people who are in desperate straits will try anything to make some money. By the way, they're charging ordinary class is about 300, I think, US dollars, and business class is about 900. But you do get an astrologer thrown in with it. Is it really an astrologer? Meaning. To what... Celebrity astrologist, wow. Katha Tinbanchorn. That's Tim Mindham from Australian Skeptics. That's the show for now. Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcast, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favorite podcast download provider and from spacetimewithstuartgary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Spacetime store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. 
or by becoming a space-time patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial-free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group, and other rewards. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.com for full details. And if you want more Space Time, please check out our blog, where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, through our Spacetime YouTube channel, and on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. And Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 